This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Well, we're in Daniel chapter 7 again this evening, and last week our time uh, for our study in Daniel was short uh, for some different reasons, but we're going to pick back up tonight, and I want us to just do a little bit of review about some of the things we talked about in that short segment last week before we dive off into finishing up, Lord willing, chapter number 7 this evening. One of the things that I put on the board up here is one of those biblical principles that we talked about last week, and it's important because we're going to see it concerning at least a couple of different prophecies in the book of Daniel, and so I want us to just briefly review these two. On the top of the whiteboard here, you see the phrase, a double fulfillment of Scripture, or... You could call it a partial fulfillment of Scripture. And the principle is that there are certain prophecies that are originally given in the Old Testament that find their fulfillment not just in one instance in the future, but sometimes more than one instance. And I use the example from the book of Joel uh, that Peter referenced on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and preached, and everyone who was there heard the gospel preached in their own native language. We call it speaking in tongues that day. It was really more so a gift of hearing in tongues. But there were 3,000 people that got saved that day as a result of this miracle of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the apostles as they stood and preached the gospel. Now, Peter in response to those who said, these men are just mad men, they, or they've been drunk. They're, they're, uh, they've been at the wine already today, and it's early in the day. Uh, Peter said, neither of those is the case. He said, what you're witnessing is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, where Joel said that the Spirit of the Lord would be poured out upon the children of Israel, and that their young men shall prophesy and dream dreams, and so on and so forth. And he said, what you're seeing here on this day, which we know as the day of Pentecost, was the fulfillment of Joel. And yet we know that everything that's contained in that prophecy of Joel, the sun turning black, the moon turning blood red, to our best knowledge, those things did not occur in the heavens that day, on the day of Pentecost. But those are things that we see described in the still future tribulation period that's not yet occurred even in our lifetime. And so we say that we had the first installment of Joel's prophecy on the day of Pentecost, and the final installment is yet to come. So this is a double fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, or a partial fulfillment here, and then the finality in the tribulation. Now this is important because there are two different topics that we're going to see in the book of Daniel that follow this exact same principle, that there will be a prophecy given in Daniel that later would have part of it fulfilled, and the rest of it would not be fulfilled until the end times. One of those things is one of the four kingdoms that we saw last week and that a couple of months ago now we saw in Daniel chapter 2 in Nebuchadnezzar's dream vision. Does anyone remember the fourth kingdom that we talked about in both Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 2? in Nebuchadnezzar's dream image. What was the fourth kingdom? Do we need to go through the three kingdoms? Maybe we'll do that in a minute, but anybody remember the fourth one? 
You gentlemen in the back, nobody remembers this one. The fourth kingdom or empire was the Roman Empire. And some of what we've seen fulfilled both in Nebuchadnezzar's dream image from chapter 2 and in what we saw in this chapter, chapter number 7, the fourth kingdom, part of it describes the old Roman Empire, but part of it has not yet come to pass. And so we, we believe that the, the Roman Empire will have a, uh, a second portion to it, an extension to the Roman Empire, that's still yet to come during the tribulation period. It will be the kingdom of the Antichrist, spoken of in the book of Revelation, and we generally refer to it as the revived Roman Empire. So this principle of a double fulfillment of Scripture has part of its fulfillment in the old Roman Empire, but part of it is still yet to come in the upcoming revived Roman Empire that has not yet happened. So that's one instance where this principle of a double fulfillment of Scripture seems to be the case in the book of Daniel. Another one that we're going to see tonight and next week also, Lord willing, or not next week, but our next time we meet, is the discussion of the little horn in the book of Daniel. We have uh, Daniel's discussion of the little horn. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But we have part of this fulfillment in history a couple of hundred years after Daniel. But the rest of that fulfillment will come in an individual described as the little horn in the tribulation period in the person of the Antichrist. You'll see that either tonight or the next time we meet depending on how far we get tonight. So this, this pattern of a double fulfillment of prophecy is not unique to Daniel, because we saw it with Joel on the day of Pentecost, but it's something that if you don't understand this is a biblical principle and it's real, you could mistake some of the things in the book of Daniel as saying, well, Daniel's prophecies concerning the little, little horn they had to have totally occurred at this point in history, or either they are all totally going to occur later on. I say this because people who don't understand that it is a biblical principle, the double fulfillment of Scripture, they end up making mistakes in how they interpret end-time events because they don't understand you can have both. And they say, well, if it only has one fulfillment, this must have been it. There is no future fulfillment. Daniel wasn't talking about the end times. He was just talking about those events that are uh, maybe after his lifetime, but they've already come and gone in our lifetime. Let me give you an example. The Seventh-day Adventists believe in an interpretation of prophecy from the Old Testament that says that all of those prophecies that were given by Daniel are things that happened after Daniel's lifetime, but they've already come and gone for us. There are no future events of which Daniel is talking. They all happened before we came along. I think that you run into many errors with prophecy when you fail to understand this biblical principle that Peter clearly taught. Perhaps you could say, no, I think you're stretching things, except for the fact that Peter himself taught this same principle when he said that that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel is what occurred on the day of Pentecost, and yet everything in the prophecy of Joel didn't occur that day. It's still yet to come. So, I mentioned this one principle because we're going to come back to it, and you'll see it again. The next thing that I want to do, just briefly before we actually begin diving into our passage for tonight, is to look at the timeline that we briefly looked at last week. 
And I want us to make sure we're just kind of uh, reviewing what the different periods of history are, what's going on in end time events. Now on this timeline, it is not drawn to scale, but let's assume that this cross on the timeline represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We're going to call this the beginning of the church age. Um, Sometime, if you want to, we'll debate on when the church age officially began. Was it at the cross? Was it at the resurrection? Was it at the day of Pentecost? And there are Lots of preachers who like to spend hours and hours wasting time arguing about those things. But it's an interesting thing to discuss. Nevertheless, we're just going to say the church age started somewhere thereabouts around the time of the cross on the timeline. This period then, which is now about 2,000 years old, is the time in which we live. What are some of the names that we have for this time period in which we live? Well, one is the church age. Anybody have another one? Daniel. We haven't seen him call it that yet, but we're going to. The times of the Gentiles. You'll also hear it referred to frequently by preachers as the age of grace. As opposed to the age of law from the Old Testament. So the church age, the age of grace, the times of the Gentiles, this is the time period in which we live. What is this event signified by the arrow pointing up? What's the event that marks the end of the church age? The rapture. Very good. All right, so here's that event. After the rapture, we begin a period of time known as the tribulation. And the tribulation is how many years? Seven Seven years. Hey, we're doing great tonight. The second half of the tribulation period, or the latter half, is sometimes referred to by its own name. What's the second half referred to as? That's right, the great tribulation. As if the tribulation itself weren't bad enough, The latter three and a half is the great tribulation. And the tribulation period itself ends with an event that we've demarcated on the timeline with the arrow pointing down. What's the event that terminates or ends the tribulation period? The second coming coming of Christ. We want to make sure now that we do not confuse the rapture and the second coming. One of the most widely made mistakes of people that don't know their Bible very well is assuming that the rapture and the second coming are the same thing. They they are not. The rapture, Jesus comes in the clouds and we're caught up together with Him. And He takes us on to heaven. In the second coming, He literally, physically, visibly sets foot on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem the same place he went up right after the resurrection. So that's the second coming. There's a battle that takes place here at the same time as the second coming. What's that great battle? That's right, the battle of Armageddon. Last Sunday morning I brought a message about Naboth's vineyard. His vineyard was in the valley where this battle will be fought. What's the name of that valley? It's in Israel today. The valley of Jezreel. Jezreel, That's right. The valley of Jezreel, which is the site of the future battle of Armageddon. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that at that battle, so many will be annihilated that the blood will flow in that valley from one end to the other, which is over 200 miles long, up to the bridles of the horses. That's a lot of blood flowing. That's the battle of Armageddon. Now, at that point, Jesus destroys all of those that are arrayed against Israel and against Him. He then takes His rightful seat on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and with Israel as His capital, He rules the entire earth 
for how many years? A thousand years, that's right. And because it's a thousand years, we call this the what? The millennium. The millennium or the millennial reign of Christ. A thousand years. Jesus literally sits on the throne in Jerusalem. People are still going to be being born and dying. But for that thousand years, he's going to personally sit and rule the earth. The Bible says in Zechariah, he'll rule it with a rod of iron. That is, everyone outwardly will be forced to obey. Now, does that mean that their hearts are right just because they conform outwardly? No. If you've ever raised a teenager, you know that's the way it is still today. They might be conforming on the outside. It doesn't mean it's on the inside. And uh, so at the end of that thousand years, the devil who has been chained in the bottomless pit for the thousand years will be released and he will come up one last time at the end of the millennium. Yes, ma'am? You're exactly right. He tries to get everyone to follow him and overthrow Jesus as the king. And uh, there's a big battle that takes place, uh, the battle of Gog and Magog. I actually think there are two battles of Gog and Magog, so I usually refer to this as the second battle of Gog and Magog. But that takes place at the end of the millennium. And then after that battle, we have the final few chapters of the book of Revelation where he remakes the earth, a new heaven and a new earth, and the new city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven that sits on the earth. And uh, so, these are the end time events that we're going to be seeing more and more in these last few chapters of Daniel. Now, I've, I've done this review for a couple of reasons. Number one, just to refresh our memory on what the end time events are. But the second reason is I want to acquaint you with the fact that not everyone believes the Bible literally the way it's written. Now, I think the Bible teaches very clearly that we are to accept the Bible literally unless it tells us to do otherwise. For example, when Jesus is teaching and preaching, we should take what he says literally. But there are times when he uses parables. But when he's using a parable, he tells us, hear the parable. If it's a parable, it's a story to teach a particular principle, but it's not necessarily a true story. But anything that's not told to us in the Bible, it's just a story, we should take it literally. Peter said in his general epistles near the end of the New Testament, no scripture is given to any private interpretation. What he means by that is we're to take it exactly the way it's written. Now, the application to my life might be different than the application to your life because I'm at a different uh, point in life. I have different things going on than you do. But the principle that is stated in the Word of God is the same for both of us. Uh, I don't get to sin and you don't get to sin. No, the, if, if it's wrong, it's wrong for both of us. As the old saying goes, it says what it says and means what it means. That's the way we are told in Scripture to interpret Scripture, literally. There are some people, though, who do not interpret, especially prophecy, literally. I say especially prophecy. I think you'll also find that those who do not interpret prophecy literally, they're probably the same ones who have liberal theology in other areas and don't interpret other passages of Scripture literally also. They want to read things into it, and uh, I think we all get into trouble when we start trying to uh, interject our own interpretation into it by deciding for ourselves what's literal and what's not. In the end times, we have the tribulation and the millennium. Your pastor and I suspect probably all of you as well, believe what 
we've got drawn up here on the board because it is laid out exactly as it's presented in Scripture, both in Old Testament prophecies and in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. It's because we've taken it literally the way it's written. I remember reading one time, even, a, even the liberal theologians admit that if you take the Bible literally, if you take prophecy in the Bible literally, this is the only way you can come up with things. There's the church age, the tribulation, and then the millennium. So even they admit... If you take it literally, this is what you're going to end up believing. So having said that, here's the millennium. We believe that the rapture of the church occurs before or after the millennium? Before. So we are pre-millennial. By the way, there are Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and others that are premillennial. Premillennial means that in our interpretation, our literal interpretation of prophecy, we believe the rapture occurs before the millennium. Now, not everyone believes that. So I want to acquaint you with some other ideas. I have some Presbyterian friends who are not premillennial. They are postmillennial. You say, how in the world could someone believe that the rapture is going to take place and the second coming is going to take place after the millennium? Uh, they believe that the rapture takes place after the millennium because they believe that we are literally going to get things good enough here on earth that Jesus will be welcomed back to earth and set up his kingdom. I don't think anywhere in the Scripture it bears out that things are going to get good enough or that the church is going to have such a great effect on the earth that the earth says, you know what, you fellows have been right all along. It certainly doesn't seem to be happening, and I don't see that borne out in Scripture. But those who believe the rapture will take place after the millennium because we're going to get it good enough for Jesus to come back, they are post-millennial. There's one other group that are called ah millennial the prefix a what does it mean when it's in front of a word what does the word a mean ah or a um no ma'am maybe in some other senses but not in this sense of the usage let's think of some words that start with an a and let's see if we can figure this out. How about the word atheist? You have the prefix and the root word. The root word is a theist, someone who believes in God. So an atheist believes what? Someone who doesn't believe in God. So this, is, this prefix means not. So an amillennial does not believe that there's a literal millennium that's going to take place, period. They believe it's an allegory in Scripture. It's a figurative term just for the purpose of teaching some moral principles to us in the Bible. Now, this is the crowd that are the, in my opinion, they're the most dangerous because they're telling people, yeah, we believe the Bible, but we believe it's not to be taken literally, it's just figurative. You get in a whole lot of problems when you start setting yourself up or someone up to decide what part is real and what part's not. You make man the final arbiter of what part we believe and what part we don't believe is actual, real. That, in my opinion, is the same thing as humanism. You've made man the arbiter of what's, what's true and what's not true. This, of course, is the, the liberal crowd. You might find some of these in some of the mainline Baptist or Protestant churches, but for the most part, the amillennialists are going to be, uh, they're going to be your Unitarians. They're going to be perhaps even some Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups like that. 
but they do not believe there's a literal millennium coming at all. That's one of the biggest beliefs of the Unitarians that arose in the 1800s. Amillennialism, postmillennialism, and premillennialism. Your pastor is premillennial in my view of end times events. I suspect you are too. If you take it literally, there's nowhere else you can end up. Now, so let's take this. Premillennial. I'm going to erase the other two here. So we believe that the rapture takes place before the millennium. But you could actually narrow it down and be more specific than that. Based on the way we've drawn the timeline up here, we also believe that not only does the rapture occur before the millennium, we believe it also occurs before what? The tribulation. So we not only are pre-mill or pre-millennial, we're pre-tribulational or pre-trib. So we are pre-tribulational and pre-millennial. There are some Christians who are premillennial. They do believe the rapture occurs before the millennium. But some think that it occurs at the end of the tribulation. Some people believe that the church is raptured somewhere in the middle of the tribulation. So they're the post-trib or the mid-trib. And there are some other more convoluted beliefs about when it occurs that go by different names. But pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. Again, your pastor believes the rapture takes place before the tribulation ever occurs. So I am a pre-trib, pre-millennial, fundamental independent Baptist. Um, the literal interpretation of Scripture, I think, bears out that uh, the rapture comes before not only the millennium, but before the tribulation as well. Now, several months ago, in our Sunday school class, um, on Sunday mornings, we went through the book of Revelation. At a later time, we'll go back through it again, perhaps on Sunday evenings, as a companion to this study in Daniel. But if you take Daniel and Zechariah and other Old Testament passages and you take the book of Revelation in the New Testament, these events seem to fall literally the way we have them outlined on the timeline. Are there any questions about any of the things we just talked about? The words pre-mill, pre-tribulational, those words, you're not going to find them in the Bible itself, but they're theological terms that describe what a person believes. So if you do any amount of studying prophecy at all, you're going to run across these different terms. And it's important to know what they mean so that if you're, you know, if you go to Google and you put up something on the, pull up something because you want to study the rapture or the tribulation period, you want to find out the person that you're studying from on there, what do they believe about the end time events? Well, if you read their general overview or their bio or something about them, most of the time they'll tell you I'm premillennial or I'm pre-tribulational or maybe they'll say I'm post-mill or I'm post-trib or something like that. But this helps you know from what vantage point they're coming and you're going to encounter them. So I'm simply presenting them, not because it's in our text, but because you ought to know it so that you can have intelligent conversations, and when you begin discussing theology with someone, and someone says something about, well, I don't think the rapture occurs before the tribulation, the light bulb will go on in your mind, oh, they don't believe this here, they've got the rapture occurring somewhere else. And you know that you're having a discussion with someone who doesn't believe exactly like your pastor does, and you can decide for yourself as we go through the study whether you believe that or not. All right. Any other questions? None. Well, either I'm a real good teacher or y'all are really bored with my teaching. 
And I'm going to assume it's because you've got a good teacher. I ran out of room to write. You ran out of room to write? Okay. All right. In the first few verses of chapter number 7, Daniel saw four beasts. What was the first beast? A lion with wings. We said that this matches up in chapter 2 with what part of Nebuchadnezzar's statue that he saw? The head of what metal? The head was made of what? TR? Gold. Gold. It was a statue of a man with a head of gold. And we said that this prophecy seems to be a prophecy of what kingdom or empire? The Babylonian. So here's Babylon. And specifically, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. The second creature after the lion was what? The bear. Remember, he rose up on one side and he had three ribs in his mouth. It seems to line up with the chest of what metal in Nebuchadnezzar's dream image? Silver. Silver, that's right. And that represents what kingdom that followed the Babylonian kingdom? The Medo Persian Empire. All right, someone besides Miss Barbara and TR. Uh oh. All right. And and the preacher didn't get it put up online so anybody could catch up. So there's the lion with wings, represents the Babylonian Empire. The bear, or the silver from Nebuchadnezzar's dream image, represents the Medo Persian Empire, which. We said the fact that the bear raised up on one side seems to be indicative of the fact that very shortly on, the Mede portion of that confederation, it kind of went away and it became known in history simply as the Persian Empire. And uh, it certainly was the most prominent part of that empire. What creature comes after the bear? The leopard with what was on his back? Wings. With wings, that's right. Signifying speed. And uh, on Nebuchadnezzar's dream image, it was the belly of brass. Brass, okay. So, brass or bronze. And that represents someone besides Miss Barbara. What empire that came after the Medo-Persians? No, ma'am, but hold on to that thought. I will come back to you in a minute. TR? Greece. Greece, that's right. And, of course, the king who was responsible for that rapid spread, Alexander the Great. And then was that last creature. What do we call it? What's it called in Scripture? In Daniel 7, it's called a dreadful beast. We, Daniel apparently had nothing, no living animal to compare this to. It compares in Nebuchadnezzar's dream image to what metal of legs? T.R.? Oh, I thought you were asking for the animal. It's not an animal. Well, the... All right, what were you going to say? I was going to say the griffin. I thought you were talking about the first creature in the book, or in the chapter. Uh, this one? We're, we're talking about the number four. Daniel just calls it a, a terrible beast. It was so terrible, he, he had nothing to compare it to among the living animal kingdom. Um, this was the legs of iron on Nebuchadnezzar's dream image, the statue. And it represents Abigail, what kingdom? That's right, the Roman Empire. All right, so 
These are the four kingdoms represented by the four beasts in Daniel chapter 7, the first few verses. Now, everything I've done tonight has been review up to this point. But it's important because we want to make sure we're all on the same page and we've got it all tied together, all the pieces here. Any questions up to this point? All right. Daniel chapter number 7. Look at verse number 8. I considered... Well, let me start back with verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth... It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. So this fourth beast, iron teeth, broken pieces, it was uh, symbolic, I think, of the Roman Empire and the Roman legions with their, uh, their iron weapons that literally conquered the entire known world at that time. But it says it had ten horns. In Scripture, horns are symbolic of power and authority. The horns that we see here are going to represent kings, individual rulers. We'll see that in just a moment. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. That word great doesn't necessarily imply good, it simply implies unbelievable things. This fourth beast... The dreadful beast is the one we're talking about. It's the one we're going to be talking about now for the rest of chapter number 7. In that double fulfillment of Scripture principle we talked about earlier, here in Daniel 7, we have what appears to be a clear correlation to the Roman Empire in the fourth beast because it correlates to that fourth kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream image. But some of what we're going to see in this kingdom or empire was not fulfilled in the old Roman Empire. So we can only assume that, number one, if it's a prophecy given in Scripture, it's going to be fulfilled because God keeps His promises. But if it hasn't yet been fulfilled, that means it's still future yet. So we're going to view this fourth beast as being partially fulfilled, but the rest of what's unfulfilled is still yet to come in that revived Roman Empire of the Antichrist during the tribulation period. It said in this passage... There were ten horns. That represents ten kings or ten government leaders. Let's see if I can just kind of draw them. Here are ten horns sticking up. Three of them get pulled up by the roots... And a little horn comes up in their stead. You say, why did you draw it short but wider, bigger, stouter than the others? Let's continue on. It said, this little, this, in this horn, the end of verse 8, were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. So this little horn is going to be um, an individual, a man, a king, if you would, 
is going to take away three of the kings, and this king will be different than the other kings. We'll leave it at that for this point. Verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. That's the thrones of the first three beasts. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Now, wheels here signifies judgment. He's the chariot moving towards the battle, impending judgment, fire is a a symbol or a picture of judgment. The refiner's fire. The fire of the refiner burns up all the impurities and leaves only what's supposed to be there. It's signifying the judgment of God. And the Ancient of Days, who's pictured here, I think we can say, is God the Father, as we view Him in in the Trinity. Verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. By the way, that word for thousand thousands, it's the word myriad. Who do you suppose those thousand thousands are? that are ministering to God the Father there in heaven. They're the angels, right? The angels are referred to elsewhere in Scripture as ministering spirits. This is the angels. There is a myriad of them. More than you can count is what the word means. Verse 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. So we look away and we see the throne room of heaven. But then no sooner do we see God the Father there in heaven, than we see once again a reference to this little horn, which speaks great words. Again, remembering great doesn't mean good. It just means unbelievable things that this horn is saying. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So those four beasts that we saw in the first seven verses of the chapter, they signify four kingdoms. They also signify the four kings that go with those four kingdoms. And this horn, Daniel says... Um, eventually will be slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Those four kingdoms that we talked about, the Babylonian, the Persian, the Greek, Each of those, you know, when Babylon fell, it fell to what empire? Who conquered Babylon? Persia. Remember the story of the handwriting on the wall? That very night, the city of Babylon fell to the Persians. Babylon continued to exist, but it was swallowed up by the Persian Empire. Persia fell to what empire? What comes after the Persian Empire? Greece, that's right. Good Abigail. Persia still continued to exist, but it became part of the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great. When Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire split up, and then eventually was swallowed up by another empire, it was the Roman, that's right. The the old Greek empire continued to exist, but it was swallowed up by the Roman empire. 
this empire, when it is destroyed once and for all, it doesn't continue anymore. When, when God says it's done, it's totally done. The kingdom and the king that goes with it. It's not going to continue. Now, the old Roman Empire, you could say, well, preacher, it, it's not around anymore at all. No, but it's broken up into a bunch of other kingdoms that are still around. All the countries of Europe make up the former uh, Roman Empire. So then we see that the, the old Roman Empire, it's broken up, but it's still around. But there's coming a day when the revived Roman Empire comes back on the scene. And the revived Roman Empire is what Jesus personally destroys at the second coming and the battle of Armageddon when he sets up the millennial reign of a thousand years. And when he destroys this kingdom, there won't be any more Roman Empire anymore at all. It'll be done once and forever. So these continue to exist even after they were conquered. This one won't be. So the end of the old Roman Empire is not the end of the fourth kingdom. It's the first installment. We've got another installment of the Roman Empire that's yet to come. And that will be during the tribulation at the time of the Antichrist himself. My time is about gone for tonight. We've come to a good stopping point. The rest of this chapter is going to delve into more detail about the little horn. Who he is, what he does. And we'll see more of that next time we come. Any questions or comments before we leave tonight? Either about anything we've covered or about something tangentially connected. Nobody has any questions. I will do that. I must be a great teacher. Nobody has any questions. And that was some, not some easy content tonight. You're just a quiet class.